They left New York two hours ago on Friday afternoon, and they still had an hour to go home. They had just dropped off Lisa, their only child, to her college campus, where she would begin her studies. Nancy looked across to her husband, Bill, who was driving their Ford Transit because they needed to transfer Lisa's items and couldn't drive her BMW 238 convertible. Sheesh, time really flies. She assumed it was her high school graduation day when she discovered she was pregnant. Bill was still in college, trying to become an engineer. Both parents were supportive. They knew each other well and were aware of their children's love once the baby arrived. She stayed with her parents, and they married once Bill finished his studies. Over the last ten years, she has been a stay-at-home mom, watching her husband advance from junior engineer to owner of his own HVAC business. His hard work paid off as he secured large contracts with construction businesses. Bill's passion to career and family was unwavering. Bill expressed sadness that the house would not be the same without her. She has always been closer to you than to me. She said, your little princess. Yes, she is our princess and deserves the finest, Bill remarked. Have you noticed how she's been acting recently? She has been treating me horribly. She attaches to you like glue whenever she sees you. Sometimes they make fun of me. And when you're not around, she locks herself in her room and absolutely avoids me. Nancy, she's still a kid. You are aware of how difficult senior year of high school can be. She was under a lot of strain trying to get into Columbia University. Try to give her some leeway. I got the bill. But have you noticed how she stares at me when we are in the same room? Remember how she came at me with a knife two months ago while I was seated on the couch? I assumed she was going to hurt me. I saw sheer anger in her eyes. Nancy, you're imagining things. Bill snapped. Nancy remained silent, not wanting to escalate the argument further. She did not want Bill to become angry. Not now. She took out her phone and sent a text message. We'll be there in 30 minutes. A minute later, her phone beeped. Is that from Lisa? Bill inquired. No, it's Betty. How is she doing with Paul? The last time we had a barbecue, she was complaining about him working late nights, working too many hours, and putting others ahead of her. She should have understood that being married to a sheriff was not easy. She should have thought twice before marrying again. Nancy remained mute hoping that Bill would retain his cool until they arrived home. She leaned against the window, hoping they were already present. As Bill arrived into his driveway, he noticed a sheriff's car parked in front of the garage. He parked behind it, and Paul, along with his helper, came out to greet him. What's happening? Bill asked. Paul was puzzled. Nancy hurried to stand behind the assistant, which caught Bill's attention. This is the least enjoyable aspect of my job the sheriff explained, handing Bill a manila envelope. William Thompson, you have been served. Paul, is this some sort of joke? Bill asked, his hand trembling as he took the envelope. He turned to Nancy, but she was unable to meet his gaze. Why, Nancy, what have I done? Bill, it's best that you leave, Paul advised. Get yourself a lawyer and work on your divorce. There is also a restraining order. You are not allowed to be near Nancy or within 500 feet of her. Last Sunday... You and Betty attended our barbecue to bid Lisa farewell. Bill spoke, his voice rising. You both understood what was going on. You arrived late, wished Lisa well, and left smiling. That's what I consider hypocrisy. Bill, please try to understand. What would you like me to understand, Paul, that you are a jerk? Bill shouted. And Nancy, you betrayed me. He glared at her, angry. If you did not love me anymore, you should have told me. I would have consented to a peaceful divorce. The restraining order is already in place. It's best if you leave now, Paul said, trying to stay calm. Bill approached his van and angrily tossed the envelope under the passenger seat. He slammed the door shut and marched back to face Paul. I need my belongings. I hope you won't be a jerk and stop me from going into my house to get my belongings. He took out his house key and approached the front door. Your key will not work, Paul explained, pulling out another set of keys from his pocket and handing them to his assistant. You seem to have thought of everything. Or was this Betty's idea? Bill is accused. She probably arranged for a locksmith while we were away. Am I correct? Paul did not respond, just nodded to his assistant, who led Bill into the house and stood by while he packed two suitcases. Don't worry, Paul assured Nancy. I'll have my guys keep an eye on the place. It is unsafe for you to be here alone for an extended period of time. Bill is very upset, and he may do something rash out of rage. 
I will stay put. I'll ask a friend to come stay with me for the weekend, Nancy said. Yes, a friend, Paul muttered. Bill took out the suitcases and put them in the back of the van. The assistant handed Nancy the keys. Bill opened the envelope and began reading the divorce papers. Bill, you have your stuff. It is time to go, Paul instructed. Hold on. This woman wants half of my business, half of our savings, the house, her car, and the monthly alimony. She's trying to take me to the cleaners, Bill exclaimed angrily. Bill, if you do not leave, I will have to arrest you, Paul warned, reaching for the handcuffs. There's no need, Paul. I'll sign the papers now and then disappear. Bill stated that grabbing a pen and signing was indicated. Can you witness this and give me a copy? Nancy, Paul, and his assistant were stunned. They never expected Bill to accept the terms. Nancy smiled, feeling fortunate. She got what she wanted and was finally free of her husband and daughter. Paul signed as a witness and gave Bill his copy. Bill got in his van. Who is he? How long have you been with him? Bill demanded angrily. Go inside and lock the door. Paul instructed Nancy before approaching Bill's van. His assistant escorted Nancy inside. Don't do anything foolish. Think of Lisa, Paul advised Bill. I made a mistake marrying this witch, Bill yelled as he started the engine. She chose divorce because she knew I would not accept an open marriage as you do. What? Open marriage? Paul inquired. Shocked. Don't act innocent, Paul. It is common knowledge, Bill retorted. What are you saying? Paul's voice. Rose. Come on, Paul. We all know when you work nights. Your brother Tom is keeping your bed warm. Are you trying to turn me against my brother? You a jerk? Man, she is cheating on you. Sorry for breaking it to you. Look, Paul, as a sheriff, you know when someone is lying. Go home and ask Betty, then you will see. Bill backed up and left the property alone as instructed. Nancy poured herself a glass of wine and stood before Pagnol's masterpiece. The train station is worth over a hundred grand. He left it here. Is it his loss? She thought with a wicked smile. She picked up the phone and dialed a number from her speed dial. Come on, Jason, answer the damn phone. Nancy yelled, frustrated, and hung up. He was supposed to come straight here from work. She muttered to herself while taking a seat and sipping her wine. Memories of their first meeting flooded her mind. It had been a year since they ran into each other at the department store. He managed the shoe section while still young and fit. She was immediately smitten. They exchanged phone numbers, and the following day she invited him over during his lunch break. He came and rocked her world leaving her feeling as if she'd had a wild night. She couldn't deny that his energy was more exciting than Bill's busyness. Bill, who was always exhausted from work, spent his nights assisting Lisa with homework before collapsing into bed, leaving Nancy dissatisfied, finishing her wine and pouring another glass. Nancy tried calling Jason again, but received the same unavailable message. Frustrated, she threw her phone on the couch and turned on the TV, but she couldn't concentrate and decided to take a shower. She recalled an intense, weak-old memory of Jason indulging her forbidden desires. He made it clear that her pleasures belonged solely to him, and he provided a spare key to his apartment. She would occasionally clean while he was at work, shower him with gifts and let him drive a BMW. God, I need him now. I am so turned on. I need him to give me pleasure, Nancy muttered to herself. She tried to recall the last time she had been intimate with Bill, but she couldn't remember whether it had been three months, six months, or even longer. It did not matter, however. She had a young lover, a real man who could meet her needs. They could be together fearlessly. Now that she was free, he planned to move in with her. That evening, following her shower, Nancy returned to the living room, grabbed her phone, and cursed again. "'Where are you, Jason? Why don't you answer the damn phone?' frustrated. She went into the kitchen and made herself a light dinner. Damn, I can't leave the house or I'd drive to his place. Then something on the television drew her back into the living room. She turned up the volume and watched in horror as Paul, handcuffed, was led to a police car. Sheriff Paul Anderson shot his wife in the head before driving to his brother's workplace, where he shot five times. According to the news anchor, both the wife and brother have passed away. Nancy turned off the television and sat down, shocked. Betty, I warned you to be careful, she cried. That night she could not sleep at all. It was the first time she felt completely alone. Her husband was gone. Her lover is unreachable. Her best friend died and her daughter was distant. Her parents have died. 
The only one remaining was her sister, who lived 300 miles away with her husband, Tom. Saturday passed with no word from Jason. She experienced both anxiety and frustration. He could at least leave a message to let me know what's going on. Nancy repeated it in her mind. When she walked into Jason's apartment on Sunday morning, she decided to drive there right away. She sensed something was wrong. The walls were bare, electronics were missing, and his closet and bathroom were empty. She collapsed on the bed. He's gone. He left without saying anything. Nancy cried. How could he accomplish this? He was the one who suggested we divorce Bill and move in together. Getting married after the divorce was finalized. She left her apartment and drove to the department store, hoping to find Jason at work. Instead, she met one of his co-workers, who informed her that Jason had requested to leave work on Friday morning to retrieve his wallet, but had not returned. Later that day, he sent a resignation email to their boss. Nancy walked towards her car, tears streaming down her cheeks. Why would he do this to me? She sobbed. On her way home, she stopped at a gas station and was surprised to discover that both her credit and debit cards were declined. Frustrated, she paid with the last of her money. At home, she drank her sorrows away. On Monday morning, she visited the bank and spoke with the manager. She was shocked to discover that her joint account had less than $5 left. Mrs. Thompson, your husband went to the bank last Friday and closed your joint credit card, the manager explained. He also informed us of your divorce and that he would no longer be responsible for the mortgage on the house or your car. That is a mistake. My car had been paid off, and the house mortgage should have been settled, Nancy said, perplexed. We have documentation proving a car loan and a second mortgage on the house for your daughter's university tuition, the manager responded. But why isn't there money in my account, Nancy asked. Your account was debited to pay the monthly mortgage, and there have been no deposits in the last three months. Whatever money was there has been spent. How about my husband's business? Transfers from the company's account should occur monthly, Nancy inquired. Unfortunately, Mrs. Thompson, I am unable to share Mr. Thompson's account information or business matters with you. However, if you fail to make your upcoming mortgage payments, your home and car may be repossessed. But I do not have a job. I recommend that you discuss this with your lawyer. Later, she checked the safe deposit box she and her husband shared. Only her jewelry remained. She gathered it all and placed it in her handbag outside the bank. She attempted to call Bill on his cell phone, but it was out of service. Perplexed, she dialed his work number, but it kept ringing. Frustrated, she called Lisa's number. What do you want? Which? Lisa snapped angrily. Is this how you speak to your mother? Nancy inquired, shocked. How else should I contact you? Lisa retorted. You are the worst. You dumped dad as if he didn't matter. I am done with you. Do not call me again. I'm going to change my number. Then the line went dead. Nancy sat in her car, stunned, gripping the steering wheel. Her mind raced as she tried to figure out why Jason left without saying anything, questioning where her plan had gone wrong. She contacted her lawyer and scheduled a same-day appointment for late afternoon. Mrs. Thompson, I received your call this morning. We researched your husband's company. Her lawyer informed her that he filed for bankruptcy last Thursday before being served by you. The company is likely to dissolve. But you told me I could get millions last time. Nancy exclaimed. Please, Mrs. Thompson, try to remain calm. Only two weeks ago, there were no signs of financial trouble. Everything seemed to be in your favor. The company's bank account is currently frozen. What about the car and the home mortgage? He used your home as collateral for another loan last week before being served. When you signed the ownership document for the car, you also agreed to take out a loan in your own name. This cannot be true. Nancy cried. Dear Mrs. Thompson, I have a personal question. Do you think your husband knew he was being served? No, Nancy responded, looking thoughtful. He didn't see it coming. She took a deep breath. So, if I understand correctly... I will not receive any payment from my husband's company. I have no money in the bank and my car and house will be repossessed. I am afraid so. Is there any way to get him to at least pay the mortgage? His company was his sole source of income. Now that it's gone, he's broke. Once he finds work, we can order him to pay you alimony. We had some investment certificates, but I couldn't find them in the safe deposit box. We will look into when he cashed those certificates and thoroughly investigate his company. We also need to find your husband. His legal advisor is in charge of everything. Please proceed. 
One thing is certain, Mrs. Thompson. These extra services will incur additional costs. How will you cover the costs? Nancy had not considered the financial implications, but she smiled. I own a valuable painting. Great. Collect the funds and write us a check so we can get started. Not a problem. I will call you soon. Just one more thing, Mrs. Thompson. In the worst-case scenario, prepare to leave your home. You should begin searching for a new place to live. At home, she sat in front of Pagnol Lay's masterpiece. I wanted to keep you, but because of my husband, we had to part ways, she told the painting. She then called her sister. Hello, sis, I need a favor. You know I'll do anything for you, Nancy. Bill and I are divorcing. What's this, some sort of joke? No, says it's complicated. I'll need some place to stay, temporarily. May I stay in your guest room? I will explain everything when we meet. How about Lisa? How does she take it? She is definitely Daddy's girl. I'm the one who takes the blame. Is there any chance you two can figure this out? Maybe you should see a counselor? I doubt it. I'm truly sorry. There's no problem on my end. I don't think Tom would mind, and our daughter would love to have you stay with us for a while. Thank you, sis. I will keep you updated on when I will be there. Nancy ended the call. On Tuesday, Nancy went to a jeweler to have her jewelry appraised. To her surprise, she was told that all of her pieces were gold-plated copper of low quality. She cursed Bill for giving her fake presents. Then she hurried to an art gallery to meet with an appraiser. I'm curious about the value of my personal painting of the train station, Nancy inquired. The appraiser meticulously examined every aspect of the painting. The train station is considered Pagnol's masterpiece. It expresses a wide range of emotions, from arrivals and departures to joy and sorrow. He positioned the painting on an easel and illuminated it with a spotlight. Then he took a magnifying glass and examined it closely. After a while, he chuckled. Is there anything wrong? Nancy inquired, puzzled. Wait, let me show you something. The appraiser took out his laptop, placed it on a nearby table, and used a few keystrokes to open a website. He displayed a picture of the train station on the screen, focusing on the bottom left corner. You can see a man and a little girl standing on the platform watching a woman walk to the train with her back to them. The man appears sad and the girl is crying. I understand. So what? Nancy was a little confused. Now look at the same scene in your painting. The man handed Nancy the magnifying glass. Nancy felt dizzy after a quick glance at the bottom left corner. In yours, the man and the little girl are laughing and pointing at the woman as if they're teasing her. It's... it is not real, Nancy stuttered. Yes, I'm sorry, but it's a pretty good fake, my God. Nancy grabbed a chair and collapsed into it, completely defeated. I can pay you $200. I just want to hang it so my friends and clients can laugh. Nancy accepted the offer and left feeling devastated. Her phone rang, and she realized it was her sister calling. Hello, sister, Nancy said, attempting to hide her distress. Don't call me sis, you witch, an angry voice yelled at her. What? Why? Tom received an email from a stranger, which was sent to everyone we knew. It is a link to a former website. It contains videos of you and a guy you dated from a year ago until last week. How could you do this, Nancy? Two. You did it on our bed and in a cheap motel room. The voice was furious. I need to explain. There's no need. You are disgusting. Tom does not want you near us. He claims you will ruin me and our daughter. We do not want you here. Go see your lover, you slut. The call ended abruptly. My God, they found out. They have known all along. Nancy's face twisted with horror. What should I do now? She went into a panic. Everyone is familiar with the entire town. I need to get out of here. Far away. Five years later, Bill sat in the church's front row, reflecting on his morning phone call. He kept it to himself. He had just escorted Lisa down the aisle, not wanting to overshadow the special occasion. He glanced at the couple at the altar and watched as his daughter said, I do, to her college sweetheart. His thoughts returned to the day. Lisa called him in tears. He recalls sitting in his office when her distressed voice came over the phone. Please come home, Dad, she sobbed. What is wrong, honey? Why are you in tears? Bill asked, taken aback. Please come, Dad. I am waiting outside our house, she pleaded urgently. Why are we outside? What's happening? Should I call your mother? Bill's mind was racing with worry. No, do not call her. Please hurry. Dad? Lisa insisted. I am on my way, sweetheart. Bill was becoming anxious as he drove to his destination. All kinds of ideas raced through his mind. Why did his daughter not attend school? 
Why was she outside instead of inside the house? Why didn't she want him to tell Nancy? Was she injured? He suddenly applied the brakes, resulting in a roaring sound from the tires. He was about to run a red light. Keep calm. He told himself he knew Lisa was working on a project until late in the day, before he even assisted her and gave her some suggestions. They put everything in a PowerPoint file and saved it to a USB flash drive. Lisa waited one block down the street. Bill came to a halt, and she entered the vehicle. Please do not go to the house, Dad. Okay, Lisa, tell me what's happening. Bill, turn the engine off. This morning I forgot my USB drive while rushing to school. During lunch I received special permission to come home and pick it up. I discovered an old Honda in our driveway. I went inside the house and noticed strange sounds coming from your room. I walked quietly up the stairs and peered into your room. The door wasn't completely closed. Lisa began crying. Okay, sweetheart, inhale. Bill spoke in a soothing voice. He stroked her back. Take your time. I saw a man. They both lacked clothing. They had a close relationship. Dad, she is cheating on you. On us? Lisa sobbed. Bill sat in shock. He realized that his 17-year-old daughter understood what cheating was. Are you sure about what you saw? He turned to face her. I recorded it with my phone. She captured it on her phone. She then showed it to her father. Bill's world came to an abrupt halt when he heard Nancy groan. Dad, please get her out of the house. I do not want to see her anymore. She's not my mother. My real mother would never do things like this. I need to think about it. What are the factors to consider? Simply kick her out. It is not simple, honey. There are legal steps we must take. Dad, do you still want to be with her? Do you still want to sleep with her? I do not condone cheating, but we need to understand why she did it. If it's a one-time occurrence, has it been going on for a while or will it continue? Here he comes. Lisa pointed to the Honda as it drove away from the house and turned away from them. Let us follow him. Bill started the engine. They followed the Honda to the store. They noticed the man putting on his work jacket as he exited his car in the parking lot and headed towards the employee entrance. He works here. Bill commented that she appears to be quite young. Lisa responded, taking photos of the guy in his car. We have one thing figured out. So, sweetie, I will drop you off at school. Then I'll go back home, grab your flash drive, and deliver it to you. When I talk to your mother, she's not my mother. Lisa cut in her voice sharp. I'll tell Nancy that you called and asked me to bring it over. I don't want you to face her alone. Not now, not ever. Got it. I get it. But why? Because I don't want her to realize we're on to her. I don't want you accidentally letting the cat out of the bag in your anger. What's your plan? I want to be in on everything you're doing. I need to be kept in the loop. Promise? I'm going to install security cameras in our house and... Sure thing, princess. I promise to keep you updated. I love you, dad. Lisa hugged Bill. Love you too. Now take me to school and hurry back with the USB. My class is starting soon. Bill pulled into the driveway and entered the house. Honey, I'm home. Nancy hurried out of the bedroom, looking surprised. Bill, it's you. Who else were you expecting? He locked eyes with Nancy. I wasn't expecting you back so soon. Lisa called. She forgot her flash drive. I need to take it to her. He approached Nancy and caught a whiff of closeness. How about a quickie? A quickie? I'm a bit tired from cleaning and I'm all sweaty. You wouldn't enjoy it. Plus, you need to get Lisa her USB. You're correct. At work. Bill, browse the internet for the best surveillance gadgets and cell phone monitoring software. Later, he went to an electronic store and got everything he needed. He made a firm decision he wouldn't touch his wife from that day on. True to his word, he shared everything with Lisa. Over the next three months, he gathered a lot of information. He learned all about Nancy's lover, Jason White. Jason visited their place almost daily, either in the morning when Bill was on the second shift or during lunch on weekends when Nancy was supposed to be shopping. She'd often go to Jason's apartment if he wasn't working. Bill discovered she even had a spare key. He witnessed Jason taking her a whole innocence. He also overheard Nancy and her friend Betty sharing all their secrets, including Betty's affair with Nancy's brother-in-law. One Saturday, Bill found the spare key hidden in Nancy's handbag. He hurried to the mall and had a copy made. The next week, he went to Jason's apartment. It was in a rundown part of town with no security cameras and the main entrance left unlocked. Inside, he installed small, hidden cameras powered by long-life lithium button cells. He also found all the expensive items Nancy had bought for Jason. 
Bill devised a plan to end his relationship with Nancy while causing them both considerable harm. He commissioned a goldsmith to create replicas of all Nancy's jewelry, which turned out to be gold-plated copper. He also arranged for a fake version of Magnolia's, the train station, to be painted by a professional artist with specific instructions. Bill connected with his childhood friend Steve, who worked as a corporate lawyer. After explaining his plan, Steve scheduled a meeting a few days later. During the meeting, Bill met with Steve and his cousin Linda, an auditor who was highly skilled in her profession. He was straightforward with them. He aimed to legally dismantle his company and then manage it from afar. His ultimate goal was to have Lisa repurchase the company in a few years. Bill began meeting with Linda regularly, either at her office or for lunch. Linda, a widow whose husband had passed in a car accident, had a 10-year-old son and had not dated since her husband's passing. Over time, a friendship developed between them. One evening, Bill invited Linda to dinner and a movie which she accepted. On that same night, Lisa stayed overnight at a friend's house while Bill pretended to work late. Bill parked his car in Linda's driveway and thanked her for agreeing to come. This is the first time I've been on a date since my husband passed, she said. I get it. I hope you had a good time, Bill replied. I did. Can we go out again sometime when you're free? We work together and you're still married? Linda reminded him she kissed Bill on the cheek. Let's take things one step at a time. With that, she headed inside her house. Bill urged Nancy to switch her car, but she was somewhat hesitant because she was fond of her Lexus. However, when he suggested that driving a BMW convertible would make her look younger, she agreed enthusiastically. Since the Lexus was paid off, Bill sold it and received cash for it. Then he secured a car loan for the BMW and put everything in Nancy's name. When Nancy signed the paperwork, she believed it was solely for the ownership certificate. Unbeknownst to her, among those documents were others that would later cause problems for her. A couple of weeks later, Bill noticed that when Nancy goes to the bathroom after having closeness, Jason would leave the bedroom without clothes and go to Lisa's room. He brought it to Lisa's attention, and she was extremely furious. They decided to put a camera in her room. What they discovered was alarming. Jason would open a drawer and take Lisa's underwear the same afternoon while Nancy was sitting on the couch. Lisa came behind her with a knife. Had Bill not intervened at that moment? Lisa would end Nancy. Later in the evening, Lisa told her father that she would not have been imprisoned had she and Nancy because she was still a minor. Bill wasn't surprised when he overheard Jason persuading Nancy to divorce him and take him for everything he had. But what the couple didn't realize was that Bill was already ahead of them. He knew Nancy often let Jason drive the BMW and even have closeness with her in the back seat. He also knew when Nancy consulted a divorce lawyer recommended by Paul, and he was aware the lawyer would investigate his company and assets. Waiting a couple of days, he took out a second mortgage on his house to cover Lisa's full tuition fees. The next day, he filed for bankruptcy, timing it so that Betty would change the locks on their house when they were away in New York, during the barbecue party the weekend before Lisa left for college. Both Bill and Lisa played their parts, Paul and Betty acted as if nothing was wrong with Paul even helping grill meat. No one would suspect they were plotting against them. On Friday morning, while Nancy was in the bathroom, Bill grabbed her phone and sent a message to Jason. I'll be at your place by eight. I want you to do me in the backside before I say goodbye for good. Hurry home and get ready to screw, babe. I'll tell them I need to run errands. Don't call or text back. I'll leave my phone at home in case they check. Catch you later my future hubby. After sending the text, Bill traced it and slipped the phone back into Nancy's purse. Little did Jason know, as soon as he walked in, three guys would ambush him, beat and force him to resign via email. Then they'd make him tell his landlord he's moving out. After drugging him, they'd clean his place, remove the spy cams, and loot everything, making it look like he left. They'd wrap him up and haul him off in a van, disappearing without a trace. Bill would keep it all under wraps, a secret he'd take to his grave, hidden from Lisa and Linda. Friday afternoon, after getting served, Bill checked into a motel. He chuckled while watching the evening news. Before dinner, one of the guys from Jason's place swung by. He handed over all the cameras and got paid. No words were needed. He didn't spill about where Jason's body ended up buried either. Saturday morning, Bill ditched his old phone, got a new one, and gave his new digits to Lisa. He then headed over to Linda's pad. 
There, he spent all his time sorting through and editing the video footage. He blurred out Jason's face to avoid any link, if Jason went missing. He crashed in the guest room and bonded with Linda's kid. Bill and Linda began the final phase of their plan, in which an elderly couple from Seattle would buy the company. It turned out to be Linda's family members. Nobody on the staff would lose their jobs. Lisa called Monday and said Nancy was looking for him. They both laughed. Later, Bill used a fake email address to post all of the videos on a raunchy website. He sent the link to everyone he knew, even Nancy's brother-in-law. He remained at Linda's for three more months until his divorce was finalized. They continued to date but kept it PG. Linda made it clear that no touching would occur until Bill was officially single. Bill promised to keep his marriage vows until the end. Staying at Linda's had its benefits. If anyone inquired, Bill could explain that he was broke and was staying at Linda's until he got back on his feet. Nancy did not appear in court on the day of the hearing, despite the fact that her house and car had already been taken away, and Bill is broke and unemployed. The judge quickly granted the divorce, with no spousal support or asset division. Nancy's lawyer did not oppose it. They eventually met in the hallway. The lawyer commented, You're quite the strategist, Mr. Thompson, am I? Bill furrowed his brow and walked back to the present. Father, pay attention. Sorry, sweetie, what were you saying? Everyone is watching the father-daughter dance now, but you are not moving. Princess, my mind was somewhere else. Bill grabbed his daughter's hand, spun her around, and started dancing to the music. Now I have to dance with your mother, Bill informed Lisa when the song finished. I promised my younger brother he'd be next, Lisa said with a smile. Bill approached Linda and asked her to dance. Later, Bill visited the bar and ordered a whiskey. Sitting down, his thoughts drifted to a phone call he had received in his bedroom. Good morning, Mr. Thompson. I'm Dr. Henry D'Souza of Dallas, Texas. It's about your wife. What exactly is wrong with my wife? Bill asked, perplexed. She is currently in the next room. I am referring to Nancy Thompson. Bill had not heard that name in five years. He sank into bed. Go on, doctor. I work as a psychologist and am treating a patient. Nancy Thompson in her last days. Her last days? Yes. Hello, Mr. Thompson. Do you have a few minutes to let me briefly explain the situation? Yes, go ahead, Bill said, perplexed. When we first met, your ex-wife told me her life story from childhood. She claimed you were the only man she knew before she met Jason. She now regrets her big mistake. She discussed the divorce and what happened afterward. She believes you were aware of the affair and deliberately set her up. She's come to terms with losing you and your daughter because she realizes she was wrong. When she left town, she only had dollar two hundred. She wanted to escape everything, especially after video footage of her affair surfaced. She got on the first bus and ended up in Texas. She found work as a waitress in a seedy bar near Interstate 20, which was mostly frequented by truckers. The owner provided her with a low-cost room in exchange for favors. After a year, she became pregnant and was forced to undergo a risky abortion without proper medical care. Later, the owner began pressuring her to form close bonds with the truckers in exchange for money. Some used protection while others did not. She already had severe STDs and AIDS when she arrived at the hospital. She is very ill and knows she is dying. Her last wish is to see you before she passes away. I am very sorry to hear that, doctor. Today, my daughter is getting married. I will contact you next week. Don't wait too long, Mr. Thompson. This is my direct line number. Hey, honey, take it easy with the drinks. You're driving us home. Later. Linda hugged her husband and kissed him softly. You mean everything to me, darling. Bill moved his glass aside. I would never put your or our son's lives in danger. Let's hit the dance floor. I'd like to feel you close. A few days later, Linda whispered from his office. Bill called Dr. D'Souza to explain that he couldn't make the trip south due to his heavy workload. The doctor advised Bill to speak with Nancy over the phone. He'd transfer the call to her hospital ward where a nurse could bring a cordless phone to Nancy's room. Is that you, Bill? Nancy's voice was barely discernible. Yes, Nancy, it is me, Bill. Nancy's voice broke down in tears. I am sorry, Bill. I sincerely apologize for putting you and our family through this. I'm now facing the consequences. I forgive you, Nancy. I've moved on with my life and I'm happy. Bill paused for a deep breath. I actually owe you something. Thanks. Following our divorce, I married an incredible woman. 
We also have a son together. Lisa considers her mother and they have a great relationship. By the way, Lisa got married last Saturday. The wedding was stunning and her mother ensured that everything was perfect. We both look forward to being referred to as grandparents. Nancy was sobbing on the other end and Bill could hear her. A commotion could be heard in Nancy's hospital room. He waited patiently until a panicked voice interrupted. Hello, my name is Nurse Angelica. I'm sorry, but I need to end the call. And the line fell silent. Bill smiled as he looked at the family photograph on his desk. He murmured, Whoever laughs last, laughs best. Here's the next story. Did you have childhood fantasies? I am certain of this. Yes, and you wanted to make your dreams come true. But if someone has a dream of becoming a police officer or purchasing a car, my wife had a slightly different one. My wife's childhood fantasy was realized through betrayal and the destruction of our strong marriage. This is crazy. I was in the middle of disposing of barbecue leftovers. My movement was abruptly halted. A sensation trickled down the hairs on my neck, followed by a chill reminiscent of deja vu. This strange feeling was not new. It accompanied each deja vu moment I had. This felt like a variation on those occurrences, which I jokingly dubbed deja vu. Before pausing, I pondered on this sense of familiar pretty. My wife, Penny, had organized the second gathering for her new colleagues since her promotion three months ago. She technically had a month of probation left, but given her abilities, that seemed like a formality. At least she no longer had to put up with all of the exhausting travel. The attendees included Penny's co-workers from Halifax Industries, as well as their significant others. I didn't like them, but they had to fulfill their marital obligations for the sake of harmony, right? I tried to persuade Penny not to attend this particular social event, but she insisted that I never fully understood the reasoning. However, these people had made an impact on her career, and she felt obligated to thank them. Throughout the barbecue, I kept to myself, quietly cooking steaks and drinking beer while they boasted about themselves. After everyone had eaten, I graciously cleaned up while Penny played hostess. So, what was triggering my internal alarms? It was a riot inside as all of Penny's colleagues' partners said their goodbyes and left for a girls' night out. I knew they wouldn't bother thanking their host. Arrogant to the core. All of them. Penny would be left alone with her five male co-workers once again. I tried to remember how long this ordeal had lasted the last time the wives left for their girly time, but couldn't. All I remembered from our previous barbecue was waking up the next day feeling groggy in bed. Well, after securing the bin lid, I went pretty hard on the tequila. I looked up and could see into the well-lit living room. What drew my attention was unusual enough to raise the hairs on the back of my neck. Penny's friends were all seated in the living room while she stood in the kitchen doorway conversing with them. As I watched, she cast a quick glance over her shoulder past the kitchen to the brightly lit entertainment area on the deck that overlooks the backyard. It was clear she was making certain no one entered unexpectedly, which was unsettling because I was the only one outside. What could she be saying that she didn't want me to overhear? I decided to remain vigilant because I sensed something was wrong. That was what my intuition was telling me, and experience had taught me to listen to it. As I reappeared in the light, it seemed prudent to return to the deck and finish cleaning up. Penny leaned out of the patio door. Are you nearly done, Kaiser? Yep. I just need to clean the grill and I'll be right in. Give me approximately five. She slipped into the kitchen, flashing that familiar smile that had captured my heart. I kept an eye on Penny while cleaning the barbecue. She was busy preparing a large pitcher of margaritas. She finished by dividing the drinks into seven glasses. My senses were heightened when I saw her pull an envelope from her pocket. They went into full alert mode as she cast a discreet glance in my direction before tearing it open and emptying the powdery contents into one of the glasses. She stirred the drink for about 30 seconds, keeping her gaze fixed on me and holding the glass up to the light. She examined it closely before returning her gaze to me. Meanwhile, I feigned ignorance while cleaning the barbecue. Penny's unusual conclusion involved placing the special drink on the kitchen table, alongside the other glasses on a tray. I desperately hoped the special drink was intended for one of her co-workers who had irritated her and was about to fall victim to the old laxative prank. Penny disappeared into the lounge with the tray, putting an end to my last hope. Despite the confusion, I finished cleaning, covered the cooker, and went inside. When I returned home, 
my worst fears were confirmed. Penny entered from the opposite direction, grabbed the spiked drink, and offered it to me. I've made a drink for you. I accepted the drink cautiously, treating it as if it were poison, but with more questions than answers. I had to buy some time. I pretended to take a sip while noticing Penny's keen gaze on me and checking to see if I detected anything amiss. I complimented her taste. How much did you drink tonight, Kaiser? I would say about eight beers. I told a lie. In reality, it was less than half the amount. Okay, I'll inform the guys. They will have to find their own way home. Do you mind if I finish this in the other room, Dee Dee, and catch the game's conclusion? After all, your friends haven't been taking up all of my time this evening, right? No, go ahead, Dave. It shouldn't take long now. With a strange look. Penny turned and returned to the living room. I remained in the kitchen, totally perplexed. Why had Penny tampered with my beverage? What exactly did she add to it? At least I could answer one question. Perhaps. I opened the medicine cabinet and discovered the anticipated bottle of sleeping pills right at the front. I opened the bottle and sniffed the contents before inspecting the mortar and pestle. The pennies were always kept on the kitchen counter. There was a residue of white powder inside that matched the scent of the pills in the bottle, confirming that it had been used to grind them. So there it was. The implication was obvious. I was supposed to be incapacitated while Penny remained alone in the house with five men. It did not take extraordinary intelligence to draw a dreadful conclusion from those circumstances. Despite my deep affection for Penny and the assumption that she felt the same way, my certainty could not exceed 99.9%. .9%. I craved the last 1% of the eel, and there was only one way to obtain it. I poured about a quarter of the drink down the sink before making my way from the den to the formal lounge in the back of the house. As I passed through the conversation, it became quieter, and several men turned to look at me. When I arrived at the lounge, I turned on the television and emptied another quarter of the glass into a potted plant. Ten minutes later, my attention shifted away from the game, which was playing on the screen, as my mind raced with questions. I suddenly noticed movement in my peripheral vision without turning my head. Penny was seen peering through the doorway before disappearing again. I came to the conclusion that I couldn't proceed any further with the information I had at the time. I dumped the remaining drink into the potted plant and checked the time. I waited impatiently, relieved at how slowly time passed. When the ten minutes I had set aside for myself were up, I rolled off the chair and onto the floor, landing on my stomach. Penny was beside me within moments, flipping me onto my back and examining my face, calling out my name, indicating that the sound had carried to the adjacent room. I could hear her clothes rustle as she stood up and left the room. When she returned, I sensed she was accompanied by at least two of the guys. I listened as she instructed them to lift me up while warning them to be cautious. I discovered how difficult it is to completely relax in a hostile environment. They carried me and placed me on a bed, because we had not climbed any stairs. It was probably the spare room downstairs. The situation didn't seem promising. I sensed the presence of all three of them still in the room. I will be there shortly. I have to make sure he's comfortable. Penny untied my shoes and took them off, and I heard their departing footsteps muffled by the carpet. She unfastened my belt and loosened my shirt before leaning in to kiss my cheek. Sorry. Kiss her. I do love you, and I'm sorry that you have made this necessary. I promise that this will be the last time. I observed her departure. The sound of the door closing behind her echoed throughout the hall. She appeared to be confident that I was sound asleep, as evidenced by her lack of effort to close the door quietly in my mind. The level of certainty increased from 99.9% .9 to 99.99%. .99%. I sprang up and pressed my ear against the door for a moment before carefully opening it. Laughter and giggles reached my ears, as did the unsettling sound of multiple sets of footsteps ascending the stairs. The upstairs area was made up entirely of bedrooms and bathrooms. After giving them a brief head start to ensure there were no lingering people, I quietly ascended the stairs outside the closed master bedroom door. I waited till my heart rate dropped below 200 beats per minute. Despite my best efforts, the sounds emanating from within kept my heart rate from falling below the double century. I took a deep breath, gathered my courage, and carefully opened the door. 
The final 0.01% certainty hit me like a freight train. It felt as if it mocked my feelings for Penny as it passed by in a blur. They say love fades over time. That is complete nonsense. Through the hole, I could see Penny having fun in bed with a man. Other men were standing nearby, watching. She cheated on me and commented on everything. It was clear that she liked it. In my haste to return downstairs, I left the door partially open. I dashed into the kitchen, vomiting into the sink. After wiping my mouth, I entered the living room, feeling like a zombie. Without realizing it, I had opened my gun safe and was holding my snub-nosed .38. The cold metal against my sweaty palms snapped me back to reality. Was my wife worth dying for? Absolutely. What is she worth dying for if it means spending her life in prison? No more. Some sense of rationality returned. Confronting the party-goers upstairs with a gun would almost certainly result in uncontrollable anger. However, facing them without a weapon could result in injury. Neither of the options were acceptable. There had to be a third option, one that inflicted pain on the five jerks and the promiscuous woman upstairs while ensuring my freedom. Collapsing onto the couch, I tried to make sense of it all. I met Penny, also known as Dee Dee, in a tense situation while driving down a peaceful country road seven years ago. I spotted two parked cars. As I sped past, I noticed a petite girl surrounded by three men wearing worried expressions. Even now, I can't pinpoint what motivated my actions. Maybe it was just intuition, but something in the scene seemed off. I made the quick decision to turn back. Two of the men approached my car and insisted everything was fine. However, the girl remained visibly distressed, so I ignored them and approached her instead to inquire about her well-being. She unexpectedly approached me, clearly seeking protection. She explained that she'd run out of gas, her phone had died, and when the men saw her stranded on the side of the road, they came to a stop. Despite the danger, I assured the men that I would handle the situation, prompting them to exchange knowing glances before driving away in their car. We trembled like leaves as we watched them go. To summarize, I offered to drive her to the nearest gas station, where we filled a jerry can with fuel before returning to her vehicle. I followed her home to ensure she arrived safely. She was grateful and insisted on inviting me to dinner the following evening. Seven months later, we got married. I've been her shining knight since then, and she was my ditty. The damsel is in distress. Over the course of seven years, my damsel was rescued more than a dozen times. It happened so frequently that I kept a jerry can filled with fuel in the garage. No amount of explaining, teasing, or scolding could persuade her to check her car's fuel gauge. Until now, I assumed we were a happy couple, albeit without children. There had only been one rough patch about four months ago, when Penny became distant and moody when I inquired about her problems. She expressed her dissatisfaction with traveling and mentioned an open supervisor position at work that she was eager to take. I supported her goals, believing that if she traveled less, we could begin to consider starting a family. Were there any hints in our bedtime relationship? No thoughts came to mind. Surprisingly, her frequent absences extended the relationship far beyond the average married honeymoon. When the relationship began to deteriorate, our open and honest communication ensured that discussing fantasies was not awkward. So, about four months ago, when she hinted that she wanted to make her favorite fantasy a reality, I abruptly stopped her, firmly deciding that I would never agree to her participation with several men. Is it even normal? I felt ill again, despite my newfound confidence. I reevaluated my circumstances. Four months ago, she was faced with the possibility of being promoted. She sought this promotion, relying on the support of the current male leaders. For a month, she struggled with the decision, periodically asking me if she should give in to her fantasies. A promotion followed, as did her desire to thank those who helped her ascend. It was a clear connection. Penny easily achieved two objectives with a single unpleasant act. This provided an explanation, but is it justified? There is no way. Returning to the kitchen, I poured myself a generous portion of my best scotch whiskey to symbolize the dissolution of my marriage. There were no ifs, ands, or buts. The marriage crumbled like a soldier after the firing squad had completed its task. A plan emerged in my mind. I thought about it and tested its feasibility. It seemed perfect. I briefly examined my moral compass. Did her actions, which wasted seven years of my life, 
justify the most severe retaliation? Yes, they did. I concluded that my conscience would not be a hindrance. The phone suddenly rang, not my or Penny's. They were both charging along the bench. The sound came from a jacket thrown over a kitchen chair. The wallet inside the jacket pocket identified its owner as Mark Smith. I paused for five minutes, torn between two alternate plans. Which one would cause the most damage to the greatest number of people? Option one would dismantle the Penny support system and potentially implicate the five individuals. Option B would achieve the same result with the added risk of putting her in serious trouble. I removed the landline receiver from its base and retrieved a container of leftover coleslaw from the refrigerator, scooping a generous portion into a bowl. Adding a few drops of Angostura bitters, I watched as the mixture turned a pleasing orange before taking four sleeping pills from the medicine cabinet. I moved to the front door and unlocked it. Returning to the kitchen, I placed pennies and another cell phone on the counter. After locating two thick candles, I awkwardly transported everything except the phones to the spare bedroom, dumping them on the bed and mentally checking them off. I confirmed I had everything I needed before silently ascending the stairs, eager to take advantage of the commotion emanating from the master bedroom. I quickly dialed Penny's parents on her phone while holding it up to the door crack. The only question was whether Penny's father would rush over to investigate the unsettling calls from his daughter's phone or immediately contact the police. Regardless, Penny's family's reputation was about to plummet, and law enforcement would be involved soon. After making three calls to Penny's father and being satisfied with the results, I turned off her phone and grabbed the man's device, activating the video feature. I carefully widened the crack in the master bedroom door. Mr. Smith stood out from the crowd, and I noticed how convenient it was for him to help me get the recording started. Except for Mr. Smith, I captured everyone's faces. Penny was clearly visible in the images. Thirty seconds were sufficient. Nobody took note of me. They seemed preoccupied. The illusion should be that Mr. Smith is filming. Who can forecast the actions of an inebriated, desire-driven man? Gently closing the door, I descended to the ground floor to reconnect Penny's phone to its charger, turn it back on, and use Mr. Smith's soon-to-be famous phone. I sent the video to his entire contact list. I heard two other phones beep from different corners of the room, indicating that six lives were in jeopardy. I went to the spare bedroom for part two of the plane before moving on to the next stage. I paused to consider whether I had already administered adequate punishment. I concluded that I hadn't. I knew that once the adrenaline rush wore off, I'd be in pain for the foreseeable future. Who could say whether I'd ever love or trust again? As a result, it seemed only fair that their suffering should last indefinitely. Wasn't it the Bible that said an eye for an eye? As the Dave Brown corollary goes, I have a nose, an ear, and all of their damn teeth for an eye. For part two, I turned off the heating duct in the spare bedroom, loosened the light bulb, and opened the window to allow the crisp, cold outside air to quickly cool the room. Then I lay on the bed and induced vomiting by inserting my finger down my throat. Even though I was gagging, nothing came up. I hoped I hadn't thrown up all of my dinner during my previous bout of vomiting in the kitchen sink. The second try was successful. Although vomiting on the pillow beside me did not feel like a triumph, it was totally repulsive. The odor almost triggered another bout of nausea, but I was able to suppress it through sheer concentration. I set the bowl of coleslaw and sleeping pills beside me, ready for action, and placed a candle under each armpit, aligning with my nipples. I practiced, tightening my upper arm against my side until the radial pulse in my wrist vanished. I wasn't sure whether the police or one of my in-laws would enter the room first, but whoever it was, they would be astounded by what they found. Many well-known people had tragically died as a result of asphyxiation caused by their own vomit, leaving little doubt as to the cause. In the dim lighting, the nauseating smell and sight of vomit, combined with a mouthful of coleslaw, could easily be mistaken for regurgitation. Furthermore, the lifeless, motionless body is devoid of both breath and pulse. Undoubtedly, whoever came across me would immediately summon an ambulance, prompting Penny to reveal the details of the sleeping pills, thereby initiating a chain of events. The subsequent video footage would heighten the consequences, 
I could only hope that the first responder didn't notice a carotid pulse in my neck as I waited for the show to start. I struggled to ignore Penny's betrayal while remaining alert for any visitors. The former appears to have won out as a booming shout from my wife's father jolted me back to attention. I hadn't noticed his arrival. Penny, what? What is going on in this world? His outburst was followed by a shriek from her mother and a cry from Penny. This one seemed distinct from the others, which gave me a sense of grim satisfaction. However, I couldn't linger on it for long. There was a need for action. I quickly swallowed the four sleeping pills and took a bite of the slaw before putting the bowl under the bed. As I was doing this, I heard what sounded like a herd of cattle thundering down the stairs, followed by the screeching of several cars speeding away. I was positive that if I were outdoors, I would have smelled burning rubber. Finally, in the silence, I heard you're a damn woman of simple virtue. Where's your husband? Interestingly, it was her mother's voice. I couldn't remember hearing her curse before he. He's gone for the night. Whether he has a daughter or not, he will undoubtedly learn about this from us. Tell him he's welcome to come whenever he wants. But you remain away. You are no longer alive for me. To accomplish this. This is not the way we raised you. Clive, come on, let's leave this brothel. The trio descended the stairs. The intensity of their conversation grew. Penny's parents appeared to be rushing down and Penny desperately followed, hoping to save her oldest and arguably most valuable relationship. Penny's sobs soon became the only sound, breaking the silence until her parents' car left. I was now in a difficult situation. I had about 30 minutes before my sleeping pills kicked in. I needed to dispose of the coleslaw first. I didn't want to risk choking on it while sleeping. And how would I explain the candles if I awoke in a hospital? That is, assuming anyone called an ambulance. As I pondered my dilemma, I heard a penny cell phone ring loudly in the kitchen. She initially ignored it, but after half a minute it rang again. I could hear her footsteps as she passed by my door. I missed the start of the conversation, but her voice became increasingly louder. She soon found herself standing right outside the spare room door. Which video? Tanya? There was complete silence. God, this is not Christine, Matt's wife. He was one of the fuck. What have I done? Oh, no. If I had to guess, the crash was the sound of a cell phone hitting the ground, and the scraping noise was someone sliding down a wall when their legs gave out. I should have been protective of my wife's heartbreaking sobs, but all I felt was impatience. The decision point was quickly approaching. Let's evaluate the situation. A family has been torn apart, and a job has been lost. With so many contacts in her address book, it's highly unlikely that her bosses would be unaware. Penny's boss might have been one of the recipients. Any mutual friends Dave and Penny had were most likely lost after it was revealed publicly that she had hospitalized me. Penny, there is only one option remaining. Wake your husband up and beg for his forgiveness. So, at the very least, try calling an ambulance. I was overwhelmed by exhaustion. I even considered eating the slaw until I heard movement. Someone seemed to be getting up. I heard the sound of the door opening. The light from the hallway spilled into the room. Penny must have noticed the vomit, either through smell or sight on the pillow, because she gasped and dashed to the bed. Dave, Dave, wake up without a response from me. She dashed to the light switch and I heard it click several times. Of course, the bulb had been unscrewed. Penny cursed has returned. She confronted me squarely. I could tell she spotted the slaw because she let out a loud gasp. Absolutely not. I could feel her warm breath tinged with tequila against my cheeks. She sat on the bed, grasping my left forearm. I tensed it slightly as I expected it to feel cold to her touch, keeping my upper arm pressed to my side. She tried unsuccessfully to locate my pulse and then recalled scenes from movies. She pressed her cheek against my mouth to detect any breathing. I held it, hoping she wouldn't detect the scent of coleslaw or attribute it to dinner earlier. However, it was unlikely that she would smell slaw among the overpowering putrid odor of my vomit. Wetness landed on my face, but I resisted the urge to flinch or wipe it away. Penny's tears and stifled sobs were the source of the sensation for me. She hurried around the bed, looking for a pulse in my other cold and stiff arm. There are none found. Her reaction struck me as strange. A small moan turned into a deep groan which resulted in vomiting. I couldn't tell if it was triggered by the sight of my stomach contents on the pillow or the realization of her actions. All I knew was that she ran to the bathroom. 
Thank goodness, I thought, swallowing the slaw. It wasn't bad. Maybe now she'll call for aid. I got up, dazed, placed the two candles on the bookshelf and tossed the coleslaw bowl out the window before quietly closing it. Another party left over. I collapsed back onto the bed in almost the same position. Minutes later, the pills took effect and I fell unconscious, still unsure what to say when I awoke in the hospital. You've heard the saying, best laid plans, right? My awakening was completely different from what I had expected. I awoke in the spare bedroom feeling extremely groggy. It was daytime outside, but Penny was nowhere to be found. I was shaking uncontrollably. I stumbled through the house, but it was empty. That coward has fled. If you want it done correctly, do it yourself. I chose to call the police non-emergency number, but first I decided to make myself a coffee. Hopefully it would relieve my pounding headache. Perhaps taking four sleeping pills was overkill. It wasn't until I sat at the kitchen table that I noticed four sheets of paper covered in Penny's flowery handwriting among the party leftovers. I have read them. Dear Mom and Dad, I believe it's necessary to clarify what you saw tonight. Although I am embarrassed, I must be honest and discuss topics that daughters typically do not discuss with their parents. Since high school, I've entertained a foolish fantasy. I understand it's a common one, but it doesn't excuse my actions. I told Dave about it, and he made it clear that it could never happen without his permission. This fantasy has gradually consumed me. Four months ago, John Clark, one of my supervisors, suggested that I apply for a promotion. He joked that if I could outsmart the other executives, I'd be able to secure the position in Halifax. Promotions always include input from colleagues. I suppose he sensed that his remarks hit a chord with me. He invited me to lunch, and my fantasy suddenly became a reality. I was desperate for the promotion to lessen my travel. He told it to the others, and they were receptive along with me in general. Initially, they recommended six sessions, but I managed to haggle it down to three. Can you believe it? I actually negotiated. Bitter disgust stayed in my mouth, leaving a terrible flavor. I took a big sip of my coffee and swirled it around. Negotiated it down to three. Did she anticipate applause for that? One session like that was already too much. It simply took that one to betray me. Us? They insisted on having at least one meeting before backing me, but I immediately put an end to it. However, they didn't take my word for it. In the end, we reached a bargain. All the meetings were meant to take place after I obtained a promotion, but they needed to get one shot as a guarantee that I will follow the conditions of the deal. One evening, John and I stayed at home, and he took a picture of me. If I refused, he threatened to distribute the photo, forcing me to quit in disgrace. However, I had a plan. If he ever tried to use the photo to coerce me into extra sessions, I could blame him for a more harmful article. Fortunately, this scenario never happened. Five individuals supported me and I got promoted. A week later, we announced intentions to have a Christmas lunch, but instead we gathered at a motel. Unfortunately, the event was interrupted due to a noise complaint. Her comments hit me like a punch to the stomach. Considering the ruckus she made last night, I could already expect the noise complaint. I debated removing the letter, but I had already committed too much work. What else could she say to cause extra pain? So last month, we hosted an event at our house, Dave's in mind. The guys arranged for their wives and girlfriends to have a night out following a party at our place, since Dave rarely travels. John and I planned to slip sleeping pills into Dave's drink so we could have a session while he was unconscious. I guess you can fill in the blanks. Tonight was supposed to be the last session. When you found me, Dave was supposed to be asleep in the guest bedroom. I completely understand. What I did to Dave was extremely wrong. I rationalized it to myself, blaming him for not supporting my objectives. I also convinced myself that he benefited from the arrangement. The promotion offered us more money and spared me from traveling. I thought it was totally fine for me to fulfill my wishes, as it meant nothing more than the accomplishment of my vision. Despite this, I continued to give Dave all the love and attention he could desire, and he seemed satisfied with me. Already I understand that those were all silly arguments, and in my eagerness I disregarded the threat to Dave, who has already paid the ultimate price for my selfishness. What you watched last night was the final incident of me being unfaithful to my husband. I'm not sure whether I can face the guilt of knowing I caused the death of a man who possibly once saved my life. Please understand that I genuinely regret all my horrible deeds, and I apologize for the humiliation I've brought upon my family.
I laid the letter down, thinking it sounded an awful lot like a farewell. She really had done a runner. I picked up the next sheet of paper. Another message to the management and staff of the Halifax Industries. I take full responsibility for my conduct and apologize for hurting the company's name. Concise. I set it atop the letter to her parents and moved on to the next one, to the partners of John and the other folks. While not totally my fault, I acknowledge my involvement in bringing harm to your relationships due to my reckless behavior. I offer my heartfelt apologies. There was one additional piece of paper. Who else was she reaching out to? It couldn't be me. She considered me to be died as per the letter to her parents. I was mistaken. To my dear Dave, my knight in shining armor, you are the man I've cherished since the time you rescued me years ago, deserving considerably more than someone as disloyal as me. I plan to hurl myself at your mercy and beg for your forgiveness in about an hour. I pray you can forgive me, so we may remain together forever. Penny, as I read the letter, my tears drenched the already wrinkled third page, showing the depth of passion and sadness within. It was then that I grasped Penny's goals. I thought which strategy she might have chosen. She wasn't in any of the rooms downstairs. Despite my wobbly legs, I ascended the stairs rapidly, two steps at a time. She wasn't in our bedroom, nor in the ensuite or the spare bedroom. With a dismal feeling, I downed the stairs and stepped outside, opening the entrance to the separate garage. I was met with a faint haze and the smell of petrol fumes in the dim light. I spotted Penny's car bracing myself against the noxious fumes I approached, knowing what I would find. A length of tubing stretched from the exhaust pipe to the cracked open passenger side window. The engine was silent and the air reeked of fumes, indicating it hadn't been running for at least an hour. Opening the driver's door, I found my darling wife, reclined with her eyes closed, her face tinged with a light pink color as my eyes adjusted to the darkness. I looked for a policy on her carotid artery, but I couldn't find anything. Her skin was icy to the touch, which confirmed that she wasn't pretending like me. The lights on the dashboard lit up, indicating that the fuel level indicator was at a dangerously low level. Reality hit me. Penny was gone. I was overcome with guilt. Was I guilty of this? No. Penny made her own choice, which led to this tragic end. She succumbed to her base desires by entering into a relationship ship with her colleagues. Although I played my part, it was ultimately her decisions that led to the loss of respect from her parents and probably friends. The destruction of several marriages and the collapse of her career. Although she also destroyed our marriage and undermined my trust in humanity, I could not completely absolve myself of the blame. Penny's final decision to end all this in order to avoid the consequences of her actions could be seen as an act of cowardice. I stepped back from the car, nearly tripping over something concealed in the darkness when I entered. Glancing down, I spotted my 25-liter Jerry Ken, complete with the spout. Instinctively, I reached for it. Empty. It had been full just last weekend. It seemed Penny had finally mastered the habit of checking her fuel gauge. Having leisurely waited for the police was no longer an option, so I dialed zero zero. The ambulance arrived before the police, just minutes before it became evident that Penny was indeed deceased. We left her in place for police examination. Two officers took my statement, during which I recounted the events and presented my notes following a blood test, Penny's letter and testimony from several witnesses. John and others were arrested for their involvement in drugging me. The term accessory before the fact is quite fitting, isn't it? John, as the ringleader, received a three-year sentence while the others received minor penalties as it couldn't be proven, they were aware of the drugging. Three of them eventually divorced. The other had to beg so hard that he had indelible scars on his knees. The latter had to endure the torment of watching his wife go outside, pick up strangers, and bring them home. Three years later, her husband found out about her actions and left her. Halifax Industries had to hire six new employees. Who would have thought that one petite woman could cause such chaos? Over time, my guilt for causing Penny to suffer lessened, and my anger at her actions towards me increased. When the latter surpassed the former, I realized that it was time to move on. I met a wonderful divorced woman named Mary. I adore her, and she assures me that she would never betray me. But I still doubted.
Thank you for taking time to hear today's story. If you enjoyed this article, please like and subscribe if you haven't already. If you have a tale to tell about your or someone else's circumstance, please don't hesitate to contact me. Take care.